Garden Success is brought to you in part by Martha's Bloomers, offering an expansive collection of plants and tools for the gardener, a boutique store filled with art and home decor, and an award-winning full-service restaurant featuring handcrafted meals and desserts. Martha's Bloomers, located right off Highway 6 in Navasota. Welcome to Garden Success with Stephen Brugerhoff, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Stephen Brugerhoff. Well, howdy, folks. How are y'all doing today? Welcome to Garden Success. We're delighted to bring this program to you every Thursday starting at noon. Today, I'm a little bit excited because, hey, guess what? Looks like we actually might get some rain in the next couple of days. Today, you know, the, the chances of rain are maybe about 15% this evening. But the projections are for this coming Saturday... A little bit over half half of a percent, right? 50% chance of rain, 65% chance of rain um, for this coming Saturday. That is welcome. We need the rain. Certainly, we need the rain for our uh, plants, our landscapes, our lives. You know, so we're really looking forward to that. I know my landscape is, and I hope yours is as well. If you have any questions, we'd love you to call in, even if you have successes instead of questions, 979-845-5689. We're here for you till the top of the next hour. Well, with increased rain also comes some pathogens with that. I think it's more important to focus on the rain, but also be aware of some pathogens you may have on some of the plants in your landscape. Let's say you're still working with a few cucumbers, or maybe some zucchini, as in the case of of Mary, who wrote me an email. And uh, she sent me this lovely picture of her zucchini plants. And unfortunately, the plants themselves are covered with a fine dust. It almost looks like talcum powder on her, on her leaves. And she asked, you know, well, what is this and how can I help? How can I manage this? Well, like I said, you know, with increased chances of rain, it means that we have increased humidity. And this particular pathogen does tend to proliferate, especially with plants that are part of that same plant family that we call the cucurbits, like cucumbers, zucchinis. You know, there's some other plants that will get powdery mildew on them. If you have crepe myrtles, I'm sure you're very much aware of that. So uh, let's talk a little bit about powdery mildew. Now, I'll cut to the chase and tell you what I mentioned to Mary as far as management of it. If you're trying to manage for powdery mildew, of course, you can um, apply horticultural oils to that. Uh, it's getting cooler, so there are some that are rated or developed for use on vegetables that are lighter oils that you can use during this time of year as it gets a little bit cooler. It'll help to manage it somewhat. And of course, you know, uh, once she gets through with that particular crop, um, it's always and it looks like there's quite an infestation on her plants. The best thing to do, of course, is dispose of those plants. Any leaves that are dropping or any leaves that she can remove, go ahead and just dispose of them. That's the best action that she can take for that at this ch at this time. But I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the pathogen, which is not something that we often consider. We'll look at symptoms, right? And the symptom is powdery mildew. It's a term that we use called powdery mildew. But what the, it actually is, it's several different types of fungal species that are specific to the plants themselves. It's kind of hard to imagine that. But um, so let's see, let's go over this really quickly. There's several different uh, genera that these fungal pathogens occur in. One that is specific to cucurbits is called Podosphera xanthii. It's a mouthful, but that's that's what that is. So again, I'll, I'll uh, mention this again. The fungal species are specific to certain types of plants or hosts, um, but the appearance, the symptoms are pretty much the same. The fungus grows. It, the fungus itself appears to be like these little white blotches. 
and sometimes if it masses enough you'll see like a powdery covering over the leaves themselves. What the fungus does is it grows specialized root-like tissue, pierces through the leaf surface, and then feeds from that. Shows up initially as blotches, and then covering can look like a dusting of talcum powder. So, severity of the infection depends on the plant variety, like I mentioned a few moments ago, as well as the condition of the plants themselves. And oftentimes, what that is, is you'll see it happening on new growth. Sometimes you'll see it appearing on older growth, but we tend to see uh, that kind of infestation on newer, tender, succulent growth. And of course, weather conditions. Now, what I'm going to mention is more counterintuitive. The environmental conditions that are perfect for these plants, I mean, for this pathogen, is about this time of year. Hot and dry climate, right? When it gets a little bit warm and it's drier, that's when we tend to see it showing up. And you'll see it in spring time as well, about mid-spring. So while the fungus does not need the presence of water on the leaf surface for infection to occur, like, you know, if you're, we discourage you from, um, discourage you from overhead watering, you know, you want to keep those leaves dry, um, the fungal pathogen itself is not spread through rain per se, you know, if the leaves are wet, doesn't mean it's going to proliferate. But if the humidity is high enough, if the humid, humid conditions, if the conditions are just right, then the fungal spores themselves germinate and they're spread by wind movement. So I'll get back to this in just a second, but I'd like to talk to Ken. Ken just called up. How are you doing, Ken? I'm good. How are you this morning or this afternoon? I'm doing excellent. I'm looking forward to rain this coming Saturday. <laughs> Well, I hope so. I hope you're right. Um, my question that I had was, uh, you know, last year with the drought and everything, we lost a lot of cedar trees. I have some uh, young cedar saplings that are coming up on my property now, and uh, they're between, I'd say, four to eight inches in height, and I wanted to transplant them, you know, redistribute them on my uh, lot. And I was wondering if you could tell me what's the best time of year to do that and if you have any advice on how to go about that. Right. Oh, so that is the, probably the eastern red cedar, right, rather than the ash juniper from central Texas, I'm guessing. I believe so. Yeah. 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 So you can do it as it cools down in the fall, certainly. Uh, spring is a good time to do this, but right now for any kind of trees, even if we're transplanting them, it's a great time to be doing it. I know it's still a little warm out outside. You know, we probably have another mm -hmm. week's worth of uh, warmer temperatures. But if you've got an opportunity this weekend to do it, I'd say go ahead and, mm -hmm. and do that. The challenge with it, of course, is keeping those plants adequately watered and protected Water. as we move yeah. into winter. So this is a great time of year to be transplanting them. Now, as far as the okay. rooting structure of the uh, transplants, if they're, hmm, I really don't know what the rooting structure of the uh, that particular species looks like you know if it's a deeper tap root, but you should be able to get up underneath it with a shovel you know right. it, sh it shouldn't have yeah. i'm guessing it shouldn't have um feeder roots that have spread too far from the central plant itself so yeah. it's, um, if you've got several you know I'd, I'd say experiment a little bit see how far down you got to dig to to get it out of there you may have to dig down a okay. good 10 to 12 inches Okay. And you recommend uh, watering those uh, on a daily basis after transplanting or uh, after, what do you, what do you think? Uh, after transplanting, you know, water, water it in when you transplant it, come back the next day, water it again, um, mm -hmm. then let it go for a couple of days and just kind of monitor it. There's, it's, yeah. it's more of a, uh, I like to call it tree whisperer, right? Um, where where you, it's more intuition at that point. It all depends on the um, the soil conditions that you have. But in my experience, right. you know, it's always good to water it in first, come back the next day, water it again, right. just in case you miss something, and just monitor it for okay. the next couple of days. But after that, you know, uh, you'll uh, depending on your soil conditions, certainly keep an eye on it weekly, uh, see if it does need okay. water. And if the rain event actually hits that tree, those transplanted trees are not, right? We could get a rain in, and it could never even affect that localized area. Yeah, okay. 
Very good, sir. Well, I sure appreciate the advice. You have a good one. Thank you. You too, sir. Thank you for calling in, Ken. Thanks, Ken, for calling in about the uh, eastern red cedars. We did have a lot of loss, um, as a matter of fact, this last year due to extreme drought of different tree species. We ha I have had residents calling in talking about the loss of a big swath of eastern red cedar uh, on their property where as they're botanizing at 70 miles an hour down the highway, as they're traveling down the highway. Um, I was introduced to a, um, a Texas A&M forester, um, uh, well, no, a Texas A&M plant pathologist who specializes in forestry, uh, Dr. Adams. She's a recent addition to the uh, Texas Plant Disease Diagnostic Lab. And um, she is going to be investigating that in some of the research. She's interested in, in uh, that subject as well as um, the health of trees and how the, um, what we don't see below soil affects tree growth, you know, associated with some of the pathogens that uh, may be taking out some of the species. So drought certainly is one of it. One of the reasons that these trees have failed, sometimes there are secondary invaders that come in. And I believe that's, if I'm not mistaken, that's what Dr. Adams is interested in, some of those secondary pathogens that can affect those uh, plants. Uh, you know, how, how can we address that in the future from the research that she's uh, interested in? So thanks again, Ken, for calling in with that question. Now, getting back to, you thought I forgot, getting back to powdery mildew, Again, it's a pathogen that is not spread by water per se, but it proliferates in a little bit higher humid environment. And oftentimes that's around this time of year when, when it's cooling down a little bit. So when you get ambient temps that are about anywhere from 68 to, to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, that's just an average. The fungal, fungal pathogen is, you know, will start to proliferate. Now, uh, not to be scared, you know, this is a day of celebration of a particular day that we like to um, celebrate with each other, a little spooky called Halloween. So don't be alarmed on Halloween, but the spores are everywhere. <laughs> These spores are always present in the garden. It's just when the environmental conditions are right and the plant and the, the associated species are there, when all the perfect conditions collide, then you might see a pathogen like powdery mildew start to take off on your plants. So the best method, best management method for this is getting to recognize the pathogen first, right? So something's a little bit off on the plants that you have, like in this case for Mary, she has some zucchini plants that started to look a little off. She started recognizing these little blotchy a uh, yellow pattern on the leaves themselves, which I could clearly see in the uh, in the pictures. From there, you know, the fungal pathogen starts to spread when the conditions are just right, when it's just humid enough. Spores start to germinate, and then the uh, plant, it's the uh, the pathogen starts to grow on the plant on the leaf surface. Now you can see powder and mildew. You know, primarily when we see it, it's on the upper sur surface of the leaves. Certainly, it can get on the lower surface of the leaves. We can see powdery mildew on succulent tissue of stems or branches sometimes. And um, there you go. Once you see it, it doesn't mean that all is lost. It just means that, you know, there are different methods to approach it, right? So you identify what the uh, problem is and then start to think about control for it. Is it is uh, are the plants at the end of their life cycle? If they are, then it may not be effective or use of your of your good money to go purchase a product to try to control that or manage it. In this case, she still I think um, Mary still has a little bit of life out of those those zucchini plants. She could uh, approach it with horticultural oil, um, powdered sulfur can be used but you know you got to be careful with that there could be a little bit of phytotoxicity associated with that as well but certainly the fungal pathogen can be slowed down with powdered sulfur um, and um, a little bit of maintenance as well now there are some fungicides that are rated for use for powdery mildew control but the best your best option is to investigate what those products may be. So let's say you go to a retail outlet, your favorite retail outlet, and you see a fungicide that is rated for powdery mildew control. Look on the label, 
see if it is appropriate to use with food crops, right? The label itself will tell you how to use the, uh, the product, what it's effective in controlling, and, you know, how to, how to properly use it. So always with any kind of herbicide or fungicide, um, make sure that you can actually use that with food crops and then you're good to go. Then follow the instructions for application and you're good to go. Other methods that you can use for cultural control is, what, what is it? Right, lately, it's uh, this year I heard about this term called vertical gardening. It's the first time I've heard of that. Basically, I've been doing that for many, many years. I just didn't call it vertical gardening, right? But that's when you're growing plants up a trellis. So try to provide a little bit of airflow through, those, through the uh, canopy itself. Oftentimes, powdery mildew will proliferate in an enclosed environment. And, you know, if you've got a lot of vegetation and uh, you get this pathogen on the leaves, if there's not... I know it's kind of counterintuitive. I know the um, the spores are spread by air movement, but you also want to get air to flow through that vegetation as well. So a little bit of strategic pruning, if you can do it, taking off some of the uh, the affected material, the vegetation as well. But also ahead of all of this, look at species or look at varietals that are uh, been developed for powdery mildew resistance. Cornell University. I don't have enough time to read out a URL or a, a website address, but Cornell University has an excellent list of zucchini varieties as well as other varietals, other vegetable varietals that are resistant to the disease. So ahead of this, when you're planning for your spring planting, uh, to get ahead of that, look at lists like that's offered by the Cornell University um, extension and see what varieties are listed as resistant and then try to cultivate those. Well, I'd like to welcome Craig to the show. Hey, Craig, welcome to Garden Success. Hey, how are you doing? Doing fine, thank you. How can I help you? Hello. Hi, can you hear me, uh, Craig? Hello, Craig. Well, folks, we've got a little bit of technical difficulties. We will welcome Craig back on. He may have to call back, but um, but uh, thank you very much for calling in, Craig. If you have an opportunity, go ahead and call back in to 979-845-5689. We seem to be having a little bit of technic technical difficulties with the phone, but we know people can get in. So <laughs> we've already had two callers, so don't forget to call in 979 845 five six eight nine so i think it's excellent that there are some varieties of vegetables that have been developed with resistance to some diseases now that doesn't mean that they're exempt from that it just means they have a higher probability of being resistant to um, fungal pathogens like powdery mildew there are tomatoes that are um, developed that are resistant to some some viral pathogens that they may be susceptible to. So when you're thinking about vegetables to include in your garden or planning for that, you know, just look for disease resistance in some of these varieties. Hey, Craig, welcome back. Yeah, sorry about that. Oh, it's quite I, all right. I live in Bryan. I have a live oak tree that's probably... Uh, 10, 11 inches in diameter. It's very healthy looking. But on one side, on the west side, on some of the limbs out toward the end are just naked, no leaves at all. Uh, the rest of the tree is green and it looks good, but it's got a big patch of this dead limbs, I guess they are. But uh, I, I don't know to try to trim those or what should I do? Well, for the, um, the branches that are that have uh, dropped leaves. So again, this is a live oak. We tend to look at live oaks as more or less an evergreen tree. I mean, it drops its leaves. It's just kind of more of a slow process, not all at once. Um, for those uh, branches that are showing some uh, uh, unusual leaf drop, go ahead and scrape the bark on it just to make sure that the branches are viable. It doesn't mean that the branches are dead, but the tree itself is responding to some sort of a, an environmental you know, um, some, something environmental that, that occurred, right? It could be a exposure, certain exposure with, um, to one side of the uh, tree to, uh, 
you know, it's just too dry on that one side and the, the, the plant is responding and dropping leaves a little early. So I'd suggest to go ahead and check it out to make sure that the uh, tissue is still viable. If you're seeing like an actual dead branches along one side of the tree, then something's happening below ground. That's my thought. You know, if you've got okay. se several branches in a row uh, that, that are just dead as a doornail and it's all on one side, um, there may have been some, some sort of uh, disturbance in the uh, root zone. Would it be okay just to trim them from a, uh, you know, looks standpoint? Well, um, well, <laughs> that's a, that's a hard one to, to answer. If you, <laughs> if you send me an email with a picture of the tree and kind of indicate which ones you're thinking of, I might be able to provide a little bit more guidance, a little bit, you know, once I see okay. it. Okay, I'll do that. Yeah, our, our email address is garden success at tamu.edu. So okay. again, I'd caution to, to just prune. I, first, I'd, I'd suggest to go ahead and find out if the tissue is living or not. If it's aesthetic, okay. You know, there I, I can provide advice based on what I would see through a through a picture. Right. I'll send you an email. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Hey, thank you for calling in, Craig. And thank you, uh, listeners, for listening to this program. You know, without your support, we we wouldn't be on the air. And I think it's outstanding that you value the service that we're providing through Garden Success. I'd also like to thank our underwriters, of course. Martha's Bloomers is great to have them as underwriters for the uh, program itself. And we've got so many supporters out there, uh, our listeners, as well as just our citizens. If you know somebody that can have value for this program, we ask you to go ahead and dial in on Thursdays to KAMU 90.9 FM, 12 o'clock to 1. But we also have this show recorded and archived as a podcast on the uh, KAMU website. So go ahead and check that out. I want to take this moment to uh, think about some of the activities that we have ongoing for the rest of the year. You know, it doesn't feel like fall, certainly not with 90 degree weather, but we're steep in the middle of fall. And with that comes celebrations throughout the, uh, from November through December. Something you may be interested in, gardening at the library program at the Ringer Library. That's the Larry J. Ringer Library in College Station. This is going to be on Wednesday, November the 6th. That's upcoming next week, I believe, at 6 o'clock. A program uh, that's being delivered by Angelina Bar Bernardini. She's the Extension Program Specialist with the Department of Plant Pathology and Microbiology. She'll be talking about managing your sick plants, bacterial pathogens. She'll take a deeper dive into common bacterial pathogens that plague house plants and garden crops in our area. Now it is a, um, it is a program for adults, 18 uh, over. There's, um, they do request registration, but there's no fee for uh, joining. So they want to know how many people are actually coming to the party. Go ahead and check out the uh, Larry J. Ringer Library online if you have an uh, opportunity, or you can call them at 979-209-6347. So that's this next Wednesday, November the 6th. That's 6 p.m., and it's part of the uh, uh, lecture series that the Ringer Library has as well. You know, we've got several different garden clubs that are meeting, and they have interesting uh, talks and, and celebrations. Some are social, some are actual presentations. I'm um, trying to isolate one. There it is. Um, there is a meeting of the Texas A&M University Women's Club Garden Interest Group. That's at 9.30 a.m. November the 19th at the George Bush Presidential Library in their education room. Uh, Quercus. Oaks of the Brazos family is going to be presented by our friend, Texas A&M Forest Service uh, Specialist Morgan Abbott. She's the regional woodland ecologist for the Brazos Valley for Texas A&M Forest Service and the Urban and Community Forestry Program. She'll talk about common oaks of the Brazos Valley, talk a little bit about their facts, biology, and some tips and tricks for management for these valuable shade trees. So if you would, consider, I'd, I'm considering whether or not that is a public program. I'm thinking it is, but the Texas A&M University Women's Club Garden Interest Group is hosting Morgan Abbott talking about Oaks of the Brazos Valley, and that's at 9.30 a.m. 
in two more weeks on Tuesday, November the 19th. There's other programs, of course, that are going on in celebration of our natural world. Um, we're starting to get more into our holiday season. I know I'll be taking a little bit of time off, certainly for Thanksgiving Day and Christmas Day as well. And we'll have programs for you at that time. We'll still have be on the air um, on those particular Thursdays. We may have a recorded program for you, but it'll be a new program, something that we call an evergreen program so that you can enjoy that. And we'll let you know ahead of time when those programs will be. Other programs that are coming up, you know, of course, go to your local farmer's market. If you're interested in fall crops, get on out. You know, I love my vegetables. You can go to uh, Aggieland Farmer's Market, which is every Saturday from 8 to noon at the Post Oak Mall parking lot. Um, we've got our master gardeners are out there once a month talking to our residents, discussing some of the successes and questions you may have about gardening. But, uh, you know, of course, this coming Saturday, 8 to noon, 8 a.m. to noon, out of the Post Oak Mar parking lot. We won't be out there this Saturday, but I encourage you to go out and see what kind of vegetables and other uh, sundries that they have there at the uh, farmer's market. Brazos Valley Farmer's Market, as a matter of fact, Saturdays 8 to noon as well, in downtown Bryan at Main and 21st. You can enjoy Texas products grown and made by Texans, plants, organic meats, etc. It's always good to... to um, peruse locally and support those organizations that are working hard to get food to your table. And then Farm Fridays, which is 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., the Tabor Road Farmer's Market offering fresh locally grown produce, plants, eggs, dog treats, etc. You might want to check that out. So I think that's wonderful that we actually have uh, farmer's markets and quite a number of them in our, in our area for the benefit of our interest in keeping ourselves healthy and well-fed. Now, we had another email that came in. It's a topic that I've visited before, but I thought it's worth noting again. Uh, one of our residents, uh, Susan, had written in. She's got a problem on her plant. She sent me this wonderful picture. She said, I don't know what this is, but it was obviously an insect on her one of her uh, hibiscus. So I looked at it, and sure enough, it was a mealybug. I don't know if y'all are familiar with what a mealybug looks like. Typically, there's there are these tiny little soft-bodied insects, and they'll have a little coating. It uh, looks like a little pout. They're covered in kind of a powder. Uh, different species look differently, but they all share the same kind of biology. Now, the challenge with mealybug species is they can be difficult to manage in the landscape, especially with a severe infestation like like I think she, like I think um, Susan has. So these are insects that have piercing, sucking mouth parts. And they, they use those, those mouth parts to penetrate plant tissue. They suck out the uh, plant juices as well. They're small, they're oval, and the adults are wingless. Sometimes you'll see them with these longer tails. And again, it's covered with a waxy substance. Kind of makes them look like a moving cotton ball, if you can imagine that. So the last part of all this, that covering, the little waxy covering that looks like a powder over them, provides a little bit of protection from contact insecticides. Now the challenge with um, mealybugs is they can build a population fairly quickly, and that's dependent on the species. For instance, a female can lay up to 200 eggs over a 10 to 20 day period. And they have the potential to produce five to six generations per year. Now, that's a generalized statement. Again, there are several different species of mealybug that we are blessed with, <laughs> certainly, on some of our plants. But it kind of gives you an idea of how quickly they can, uh, generate, uh, they can generate a population and how prolific they can be from the number of eggs that they can lay at any one time. And of course, there's different websites where you can find information about mealybug biology. Now, as far as recommendations for management, you can use insecticidal soaps. So, Sue, Susan, you can use insecticidal soaps for that. Certainly, this time of year, you know, it's getting a little bit cooler. So, we can use products developed as horticultural oils or what... Um, what has become very popular within the past, what, 20 years, a uh, product called neem oil, 
right? It's basically, it's an oil with insecticidal properties in it. Um, the most success with these type of products are, is really dependent on the insect's stage of development. Now, Susan had mentioned that she used a, a product that was made by the, uh, a product that uh, has an active ingredient that is a pyrethroid. So we know that pyrethroids are challenging uh, because, you know, different types of insects that we consider to be beneficial, uh, it can affect them as well as the target in, uh, insect, right? So sometimes you may have to use a, a product, and this is one that Susan, uh, that was her choice of, of, of use for control of bealy bugs. So again, you can use uh, insecticidal soaps to kind of combat that or horticultural oils. Um, she chose to use a uh, pyrethroid, which can be effective, but she, under, she also understands that it can affect other species as well. Uh, it's a, it's a, a contact um, pesticide. And unfortunately, pyrethroids can are, are highly toxic. This particular product with the active ingredient is highly toxic to aquatic life. So I suggested to her, you know, if you're going to continue to use that, you know, um, use it in accordance with the label instructions. Make sure you're not a, around a body of water where that that um, product can get into it, like a pond. If she's got some some um, aquatic life in there it may affect that negatively. So just to be aware of label, uh, label application instructions, and I, I think she's good to go. So while mealybugs are pests that feed on plant sap, and we know uh, what, how they look, you know, if you don't know how they look, the best thing to do is go online, plug in uh, the tag word mealybug, and you'll come up with a host of these wonderfully, they're interesting looking critters, but it'll help you to identify them. One key thing to all of this for uh, Susan and to y'all that are listening is vigilance. You heard me mention this before regarding um, another, another pathogen a little bit earlier, fungal pathogen, powdery mildew. Same thing with these insect uh, infestations. Monitor your plants regularly so that you can catch infestations early infestations early now for Susan unfortunately it kind of got get away with you I have the same challenge at home I've got some plants that just look fine and dandy and I think I'm checking them out daily or weekly and lo and behold one day I just have a an infestation that is that seems to have appeared overnight but that's something that's been occurring over time we try to catch them early but if we can't you know it's no fault to you it just means that you miss that that window so vigilance is always key to catching them early so that you can apply horticultural soaps or oils at a time when you have light infestations again those soaps and the oils help to break down the insects waxy coating which can make them more vulnerable to their environment so always good to be proactive keep on top of it before it does become an issue and you may have to uh, resort to other methods for removal. So thank you again, Susan, for bringing that to my attention and providing me an opportunity to talk to our, our um, residents as well as our listeners to the program. Now, I had another interesting email that came through. This was over the, over the, uh, overnight. Let me see if I can find it. This came through email. And what it is, it's an oak. So um, it's Elizabeth. Hi, Elizabeth. Thank you very much for sending in an email with wonderful pictures. Again, without these pictures and clarity, um, it's always best for me to really capture what's going on in your life or what, what's going on with your plants. So she has a wonderful tree. It's called a chinkapin oak. If you don't know what a chinkapin oak is, they're elegant trees. They can get to be about 60 feet tall, maybe a little bit taller, depending on the, um, you know, depending on the environmental conditions. If you ever look at a tree's profile online and you see that it gets to be maybe 80 feet tall or 100 feet tall, in our yards, there are a lot of stressors, you know, in, in the urban environment, in the city, right? Whether it's us walking across the front lawn repeatedly or just exposure to... Um, exhaust fumes from cars or you, you kind of get get what I'm where I'm going with this there are a number of environmental stressors that we have in the city and so a tree may never reach its full potential 
right? Compaction, uh, certainly uh, soil compaction certainly plays a role in the uh, in the uh, growth of a tree. So while it may be rated at 100 feet, we can plan on a tree getting pr fairly large, anticipate it may get to be about 60 to 80 feet, you know. There's other uh, things involved with that. Well, I want to, I'll get back to that in just a moment. So thank you very much, Elizabeth, for writing in, and I'll I'll talk about that in just a moment, but I'd like to talk to John right now. John, thank you very much for calling into Garden Success. Hey, uh, thanks for taking my call. Yes, uh, sir. I've got uh, uh, one thing to say, and then I have a question. Uh, the uh, it was for the guy that was uh, uh, transplanting trees or, or moving them or doing whatever. Uh, for Texas, the first Friday in November is Arbor Day, and that's actually tomorrow. And so that's a good day to plant trees. Uh, I remember this week, and I know it's still a little hot. But uh, anyway, uh, that's one thing else. I've got some trees I'm going to plant tomorrow as well and during, and this weekend. Um, and the way you had said to water, water them a couple of times right away, and then every two or three days as, as, as they go, that, that's spot on. That's the way to do it, I think, from what I've understood from Arbor Day Foundation. Anyway, uh, the question I have is about a climbing rose, and I'm not sure what, what it is. Um, but is it okay to trim them back at this point? I've got one that's actually gone crazy. <laughs> it, it's, it's climbed up the structure I built for it, and it's it's spreading out like uh, I'll get out. So I was just wondering. I know probably February or is probably a better time, and I can wait, I think, but I was just wondering if it was okay to trim them back at this point. Well, hmm. I'll, there's always a caveat with everything I say. <laughs> and I've heard colleagues okay. say, say, say the same thing, and I think it's, I kind of giggle at it. I can hear my colleagues saying this. Well, it all depends. <laughs> But right. we, we try right. to approach it with best practices, and thank you for, for uh, bringing that up as well. So roses, typically, we wait until spring to, um, to, provide, right. to prune them, and the only reason for that is pruning is an invigorating action. We had a successful okay. uh, program, as a matter of fact, this past Saturday, Trees for Brazos County. We had 103 people attend this program, so I thought that was a really successful event. Um, and we did talk about um, different aspects of tree maintenance and management. And I forgot to mention that in my presentation, right? But yeah, so getting back to the point, um, uh, pruning is an invigorating action. It can cause those plants, roses, to start gr putting out new growth. So generally we say, you know, a light maintenance now, but no heavy pruning until uh, spring. Okay. I can do that. Yeah. And I, I just was curious, and I thought, well, maybe I should call and find out. Yes, sir. But I'm really glad you did call because you remind. You're right. T tomorrow is Texas Arbor Day, which is wonderful. There's yep. all all sorts of programs that happened last weekend, and that was on a game day, right? We had, we had an outstanding showing oh, yeah. at, the, at the game day, and I'm glad people came to our program. But um. Yep, you're right. This is the right time to be planting, putting trees into the ground. We've got to get their roots established before a winter sets in. We really never know what the winter's going to bring. Yeah, and one of the other things that they have said, too, and I didn't mention this, is don't fertilize them when you move them. Put them in the dirt that they came in, and, you know, I guess that comes with a caveat, too, but uh, still, they said don't fertilize the tree. Oh, you were so, burn the root before they get going. You were so right. You were so right. We don't want to fertilize the trees. We want them to get settled in. It's more important so to get them settled in. Exactly. And as time right. goes on, you know, of course, as time goes on, um, the trees will tell you whether or not there's a de there's a deficiency. But you're right. We don't fertilize them when we put them in. And and I never for I have never fertilized a tree that I put into the ground. As long as it's the right plant in the right place, you're pretty pretty well off. Yeah. Yeah, and the cedar trees that he was talking about, he's probably going to have about a hundred percent or close ninety ninety percent success rate because those things will grow. I mean, obviously we had that drought and they kill a, and really deep freezes that stressed everything. But anyway, um, it, something got a hold of them, and there was a lot of them there all around the countryside that were dead. So 
but they're coming back, little ones. Yes, sir. Okay, that was it. Hey, well, thanks so much. Thank for, yes, sir. Thank you so much for calling in. Hey, well, I'd like to welcome our, one of our colleagues, um, an outstanding professional, uh, Jennifer Nations. Jennifer, how are you doing? Good. Doing better than my Burford Hollies, <laughs> which is what I'm calling about. <laughs> Although they reflect how they look now is how I feel some days. <laughs> they are, uh, they're, they're kind of struggling. They're on the struggle bus like me. Um, you know, they're just like foundation shrubs, right? I've been in my house going on five years but they have you know they were there when we got there so they're established you know they're just the foundation shrubs that are just at the front of the house i don't do anything to them they're the area is irrigated so it's not like they're not getting watered but i was admiring my little um pollinator garden that i got from rooted in a while back admiring that the other night looking at all the butterflies and then i look at the burford hollies right behind them and they have leaves on the top but like between the ground and the middle of the shrub, I noticed that they're really like I can see the trunks, but they've lost a lot of leaves. And I'm wondering, am I going to lose them or is do I need to prune them or? Oh, my goodness. So um, I, I, thank you. Thank you for bringing that to the attention. We have I have had some um, residents or clients calling in. Not not frequently, but you know, in the past uh, six months, kind of saying the same thing, and there's not one thing we can pin on it. Um, mm. So we start to look at to at other things like are there there's no spotting the leaves or or any kind of um, expression that you can tell is part of a pathogen. Uh, right? That was going to be the next thing I was going to look at. Okay. So yeah, I'd say look for any kind of leaf spotting or any other indication that there may be a. Um, uh, some sort of a pathogen present. Um, the only other thing, so the the shrubs themselves, are they pruned? Are, do you prune them into a shape, or do you just kind of let them go? They're, they, I, I've never touched them. Okay, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> that's good. Uh, some, that seems like work, and I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right there with you <laughs> as far as that goes. But um, when I worked for the city of Houston, uh, we were trying to, you know, I, w I was I, I was fortunate enough to be trained in my, in my profession. I was working with other uh, landscapers or gardeners with very little ex um, experience. We trained them how to prune, uh, formally prune shrubs like that, like Burford hollies or others that can handle a formal pruning um, to prune them, you know, with the um, swelling of the uh, branches. It, it kind of looks like a, they're wider at the bottom than they are at the top mm -hmm. instead of the inverse, right? But I was thinking, you know, maybe there's some shading going on that is um, causing that kind of decline on the branches. But it doesn't sound that may not be the case, not not from what yeah. you're describing. I'm a, I'm kind of at a loss. The other thing okay. I can think of is, you know, is related to water. Like they they don't get enough water, or possibly if they're in standing water, that could be the decline of some branches as well. Yeah, that's the other thing I was going to look at because I've got it's it's weird. They're on the same zone as those roses that I by the um, driveway that I sent you a picture of, and those the roses only get drip irrigation water, and then they just get absolutely annihilated by the afternoon sun. And then these are kind of on the other side of the house, and they get I think they get a little bit of overspray from a couple of the other irrigation zones, so they're definitely getting water. But yeah, maybe they're holding too much water or something. Yeah, so look look out for expression on the leaves. If that ain't it, and this probably is related to water. Okay. Well, hey Jennifer, thank you so much yeah. for coming to the program this past Saturday. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, and I was just gonna say, yeah. Speaking of water, um, just a friendly reminder to um, if you're a College Station water customer, um, I know it's been really really dry, but we still have the sprinklers nixed ten to six. So when you're watering at eleven o'clock in the morning on Saturday, and the people who know who know what neighborhood I live in, they know who I'm looking at. Um, <laughs> that's uh, it's not doing your landscape any favors. You're still losing water to evaporation, and it's against city ordinance. But uh, so yeah, we got to give our landscape some water. But before ten a.m. or after six p.m., please. Oh yes, please follow that advice. Well, you know, we're going to get some rain hopefully in the next couple of days, but it may not be enough. I hate to say it. Yeah, I know. We thought Halloween was going to get rained out, and we didn't. I didn't want that. My kids didn't want that, but um, we we do need some rain. We so. do. 
Well, thank you so much. Hey, thank you, Jennifer. Folks, just like Jennifer, Craig, and John, if you have an opportunity to call in, we've got about another 13 minutes on the clock, 979-845-5689. We do appreciate your support and your interest in the program and sharing uh, information as well. The benefit of this program, of course, is we're educating each other. When you call in and you ask questions, I'll have the answer, or if I can't, if I don't have the answer immediately, of course, I'll look that up and get back with you on that. Um, and thank you very much, Jennifer, for calling in about the Burford Hollies. I do appreciate that. So getting back to who was Elizabeth. She has a chinkapin oak. Chinkapin is, I would spell it, but I'd ask you to look that up. It's kind of like my last name, Brugerhoff. Dare you to spell it without looking it up. <laughs> so, but chinkapin oaks are beautiful native uh, Texas uh, trees native to Texas. They have more of an upright growth, so not quite columnar, if you can imagine that. They do have a little bit of spread, but they will get, uh, they will make an effective shade tree for you. And they have, if I remember correctly, they have a medium size growth. So they're not extremely fast growing, but they're kind of at the top of that range annually every year you may get about um, you know a foot of, of growth on the on the limbs themselves on the stems you may get closer to two feet um, but I would consider it not to be really a fast growing tree but it, it, it has a steady pace throughout the years and it has these outstanding leaves I'll have to describe it to you and I ask you to look that up so chinka pin oak ch I said I wasn't gonna spell it but I'm gonna do it anyways C H I N Q U a chinqua pin c h i n q u a p i n it is an oak tree and when you see the leaves you're going to think it looks like a chestnut right it kind of resembles some of those tree species that we see on the eastern seaboard or up in the east uh eastern part of the united states so if you're from that part of the um of the united states of course you are welcome here in texas we love you right but it may be a tree that you may be may bring some familiarity to you we don't want you moving plants right from uh, the northeast part of the united states there are some plants that just won't work here peonies good luck you know they won't work here uh, in uh, central texas in college station or even Bryan or the brassus valley region but there are plants that are appropriate for our area, trees in this case, that may look like something from, from that part of the country that you came from. So it, it would be a, a little bit of a welcome for you visually if you decided to use a tree like Chinga Pin Oak in your landscape. And Elizabeth does have one. Unfortunately, now this is not the case. Every Chinga Pin Oak or any other oak that you get is not going to have this fungal pathogen on them but it may occur every once in a while so just be uh just settle in if you think of a larger tree that would be appropriate for your landscape and you have enough space chinka pin oak is one to consider schumard oak is another one quercus schumardii i'm being fancy that's the taxonomic name there's a couple of other larger tree species that may work for you as an effective shade tree but in elizabeth's case she does have spotting on the leaves so great picture nice um clear pictures i get all excited about that unfortunately what i've identified it as is a fungal pathogen called tubachia leaf spot it is a fungal pathogen that kind of shows up every once in a while in some of these trees. Uh, environmental conditions are just right. Oftentimes on some oak species, you'll see um, infection, the result of the or symptoms occurring in late summer, sometimes early fall. And this is spot on, no pun intended. The fungal spots we can clearly see on the foliage of a tree. And unfortunately, it's covering most of the leaves as well. Um, sometimes you'll see it associated more with uh, wet conditions. We don't have that right now, but there's other um, other stressors that can that can um, assist if you think of it that way. Uh, the infection of that particular fungal pathogen. So how do you treat that, Elizabeth? Well, fortunately, we're in a tail end of the uh, season when a tree like chinkapin oak is going to drop its leaves. Right. So these are deciduous trees. They're large trees that are deciduous. Um, there is 
re- the, what you can do is improve the cultural skills that you've got with that. What I mean by that is make sure the tree is you know, in a sound place, it's in the right place. There's not too many environmental stressors that are happening around it. Like, you know, try to relieve uh, any kind of foot traffic around it if it's in the middle of a path, which this plant is not. That could be uh, uh, an additional stress that would make the tree more susceptible to some of these uh, secondary infections, right? Or these primary in this case. So uh, alleviating that for it, uh, proper pruning methods for the tree itself. Um, Annually, we don't want to prune more than a quarter of the total foliage off of the tree. I've heard some uh, professionals say no more than a third. You just want to be light on the pruning on trees like this. We want them to take their natural shape. Sometimes we may not need to prune them at all, right? It's not an annual process that you need to do. Depends on the condition of the tree. Sometimes, uh, you know, we may need to open the canopy up a little bit. But again, we don't want to prune more than a quarter of the total foliage. And when you do prune a, a branch, there's a specific way of doing that. Look out for some programs next year where we'll be hosting through our Brazos County Master Gardeners effort and through my educational efforts, some programs addressing proper tree pruning. We'll do that out at our demonstration idea garden. That garden is managed by our Brazos County Master Gardeners. So a shout out to our Brazos County Master Gardeners for their excellence in assisting at AgriLife Extension and best practices of horticulture. So thanks again to our Brasses County Master Gardeners. If you see one on the street, tell them howdy and and thank them for their service. But again, we will have uh, programs related to tree maintenance and care next year. You just have to go to our website, txmg.org forward slash Brazos to keep, uh, keep up with the programs that we have upcoming. So getting back to the fungal pathogen, Unfortunately, all you can do is remove any leaves that fall to the ground, dispose of them. Um, You could, I I hate to say bag them and throw them away, but you may consider that. If you have a a, a composting process or program where you can actively, um, you know, um, through the action of composting, really reduce those uh, future fungal pathogens, you know, go ahead and do that. Other than that, just get those dead leaves out of the way, um, out of the area. Uh, Chemical treatments, really not warranted for this particular pathogen. Unfortunately, the trees that we have, fungicides are preventative rather than curative. You may not have the equipment to adequately cover the entire canopy. You know how trees, uh, big trees can get. You may have an opportunity if it's a small sapling, but um, in this case for Elizabeth, the tree is actually fairly large, she may not, it may not be as effective treating it with a fungicide at certain times of the year when the, when the pathogen is more uh, uh, prolific or present. So, um, you know, uh, you may not be able to do that. So the best thing you can do if it's infected is to go ahead and try to um, clear the, uh, any leaves, affected leaves that you have and just continue to cultivate that tree. In this case, uh, for uh, Elizabeth's tree, there's no nutritional deficiency that I can see on the foliage, right? So adding fertilizer to this is not going to resolve the problem. So Elizabeth, unfortunately, your tree has an infection. The good news is we're coming into a season where it's going to drop its leaves, and then it's up to you to remove some of those uh, dropped leaves as well. So I'm sorry you've got this on your tree, but it's not a lost cause. Continue to cultivate that tree because it looks like a very healthy tree. And I'm sure you will. It looks great in your landscape. Well, folks, we're almost at the top of the hour. I thank again Ken, John, Craig uh, for calling in, as well as Jennifer, our colleague Jennifer Nations with the City of College Station and the Water Conservation Programs. They have some outstanding programs reminding us of our environmental responsibility and the impact we have to our neighbors as well as to our environment on our water use. So if you have any um, messages from the, your city, from your municipality, whether it's Bryan or College Station, as far as watering, please pay attention to that. We want to make sure that we have water for the future. We're banking water right now for our future selves. So thank you again, Jennifer, for calling in. Y'all don't forget, we've got a lot to celebrate this fall, including each other. Now is the time to be getting together with family and friends. 
today is the uh, elephant in the room. Of course, it's Halloween. If you're going out trick-or-treating, just make sure that you're safe while you're doing that. Watch out for on oncoming cars always, <laughs> especially if you have little ones. I know you're going to do that, but just telling you to be safe, and I'm sure you will be, and you'll have a great time while you're out there. Fortunately, we've got a chance of rain this evening, so hopefully it doesn't rain on the parade, but um, I'm sure you'll have a great time in any way that you celebrate uh, this um, this evening. Dia de los Muertos, we celebrate uh, our loved ones that have passed away uh, overnight as well as into tomorrow and for the next couple of days. Of course, I, re I remember my uh, relatives and uh, my uh, ancestors as well, so I, I hope that you do as well. Um, for Thanksgiving, well, you know, I've got a birthday that's coming up really soon. I'll give you a hint of my birthday. It comes every four years on Thanksgiving. Unfortunately, it's not this year, but I tend to celebrate um, on, uh, on my birthday, and I know you will as well. And then we've got the, uh, the big holiday season coming up in December. Again, we'll be on the air every Thursday starting at noon. I love to bring this program to you. We thank you for we thanks to our and thanks to our underwriters, Martha's Bloomers, as well as to the um, uh, KAMU for supporting this program, Garden Success. We're successful because you're successful as well. With the questions that you're bringing to our attention, it helps to educate us. Right, uh, we'll find some answers for you if we don't have them immediately. And oftentimes, we get to discuss some of the uh, some of the best practices that we all share. So, thank you for calling in. I've got some other emails that have come in. I'm, I'll try to save them for next week's uh, discussion as well. Um, let's see. Oh, one person, Alexander, wrote in. He wants to know what is a good ground cover plant to use in Aggie Park. Oh, he says, what is the ground cover plant used in Aggie Park? It appears viney and has quarter-sized yellow flowers. Well, Alexander, I'm going to have to go to Aggie Park <laughs> and check that out. If it has yellow flowers, it might be... Mm, I'm, I'm losing the name. I can picture it. Um, there was some uh, ground cover that's used around one of the buildings I used to work at when I was working on campus. Uh, Wadelia, that's it. Potentially, it could be Wedelia. Uh, the species that's used is um, uh, it's a non-native but very successful ground cover, kind of uh, diamond-shaped leaves. You know, long, a little bit long, lanceate diamond-shaped leaves. It produces a yellow flower, and it works well in uh, in an understory and in, in shade with a little bit of sun exposure. It works well too. Uh, it can be aggressive. But uh, I'll have to go to Aggie Park and see if that's what it is. So thank you very much, Alexander, for writing that in. And it gives me an opportunity to go visit another park in our area. Well, folks, until next Thursday at 12 o'clock, I bid you adieu. Don't forget, 979-845-5689 for call-ins, for emails, gardensuccess at tamu.edu. You all have a blessed day. And of course, next week, I'll see you in the garden. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Stephen Brugerhoff. Join us again next week as Stephen discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley. Garden Success is brought to you in part by Martha's Bloomers, offering an expansive collection of plants and tools for the gardener, a boutique store filled with art and home decor, and an award-winning full-service restaurant featuring handcrafted meals and desserts. Martha's Bloomers, located right off Highway 6 in Navasota.